All right, so it is day two. We're here at Hub 2. This is our final presentation for today in the room. Of course, there's more panels, more sessions afterwards. Don't forget the cocktails event in the evening, but let's stick around here for one more presentation. Uh, this one has to do with augmented reality. We have a cool device here. Uh, Sun is here, going to talk about deep learning with AR. Um, very excited for this talk, so let's give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, it is my great pleasure to have an opportunity to present my uh, interesting research. So basically, I'm uh, MD PhD. I'm a physician scientist. Yeah, that's how I define myself. In the morning, the, uh, Dr. Stephen Wong told you that you got to work with physician scientists. Yeah, that's me. So, um, but I'm not a data scientist. But for the goal. For my uh, research goal, I utilize uh, necessary tools, and the deep learning algorithm was one of the tools that I had to use for this type of uh, research. So how many of you have uh, some experience in augmented reality? Can you hold? Uh, yeah, not much. It was totally different than my experience before. I went to the immersive media conference, Cornell VR Symposium, two weeks ago, and every audience had that experience. But here, it is totally different. Now, who knows the like transeptal catheterization? Who knows it? Yeah, some doctors may know. <laughs> right. So. Uh, it is really a uh, difficult topic to handle uh, at once, but uh, I'll do my best to uh, uh, let you understand what I'm doing and uh, try to make you get some impression from there on. So there has been a tremendous uh, advancement in the device-wise for the like mobile uh, computing devices. Uh, one of them was developed for the virtual reality. The virtual reality devices uh, has a, a, a limited space, so all the physical environment is separated. So you can only watch through the uh, glasses. And the augmented reality, uh, they, uh, the digital display is separated from the physical environment, and so you need some display devices for that. And uh, mixed reality, uh, this is what I'm using. Uh, I didn't bring from the outside booth, but uh, this is in my lab. So, so this one is very uh, weird thing. So it combines augmented reality and virtual reality all together. So you can like generate a hologram in the physical world. So uh, that is very special for now. So. And doctors in cardiology uh, have been interested in uh, uh, utilizing this type of extended reality. For example, while they are doing some uh, procedures, they watch these x-ray images, and, but they want to approach to the three-dimensional space, so, but they have no idea where the catheter is exactly, but only experienced interventional cardiologist knows where they are. So they have to uh, rely on their experience but there is a, like a pre-procedural uh, like 3D scans, CAT scans uh, uh, before the procedure. Utilizing that images and combining the 2D images, we can uh, make some three-dimensional visualizations from there on. So, and uh, augmented reality, uh, rather than augmented reality, uh, AI ML is also utilized in clinical applications. M uh, four major field are uh, um, medical image segmentation, automated measurements, automated diagnosis, and automated predictions. So for, um, for my topic, I was more focusing on medical image segmentation part. So before this talk, there was a tweeting, Twitter, and there was an omics, and this is about the medical imaging. So what is transeptal catheterization? So I'm showing some sample video from Boston Scientific. Uh, I have no, con uh, no interest in the <laughs> company at all, but this video is really nice. So this procedure is approaching to the left heart. So the procedure goal is to block some of the spaces where the thrombosis can occur in our heart in order to uh, prevent that uh, uh, life-threatening uh, thrombosis in the heart, doctors sometimes uh, implement some of the medical devices inside the sac. If you can see, the left atrial appendage is the one of the structures that commonly makes thrombosis in it. So we have to 
put some uh, some yeah blockers on it. So in order to reach that, we uh, go there not by opening the heart, but by using the blood vessel. Using this catheter, uh, we puncture the wall between the left heart and right heart, and we can approach to the other side. By using this technique, uh, we can do many types of other uh, procedures, like uh, left atrial appendage occluder device implementation, trans catheter mitral valve development, um, repair therapy, or the arrhythmia treatment using pulmonary vein isolations. So there has been tremendous uh, uh, advance in this type of technology. Like in 1959, uh, there was only, uh, this tool was only useful for the hemodynamic assessment, measuring the pressure of the each chambers using this catheter. But after that, uh, uh, doctors developed and technology developed uh, different tools like percutaneous volume, mitral valvuloplasty, and uh, also, uh, doctors began to treat arrhythmia using pulmonary vein isolation. And the device that I showed before was uh, uh, atrial uh, appendage occlusion devices. And uh, after that, there has been a lot of development, even the, uh, the stent implantations, which was done only by surgery, can be done uh, endovascular right now. So there has been increasing use, increasing indications in this type of technology. But be, uh, in order to approach to the left heart, left atrium, uh, we need uh, uh, this puncture. But as you can see here in th this video, uh, it was punctured uh, just before that. But you didn't notice that. There was a septum like this. And this catheter was puncturing there. Uh, experienced interventional cardiologists where they are puncturing. But usually, most of them, most of the other doctors or less experienced uh, doctors don't know where they are puncturing at all. So, uh, for example, even in like some images are very not clear, like a lot of like different materials, radio opaque materials around there, and uh, so, uh, it makes it difficult to uh, make the three-dimensional feeling where they are puncturing. And uh, so what we can uh, add to this imaging is like transesophageal echocardiogram. But it means like uh, putting the echocardiography into the, your esophagus. So you have to like swallow uh, the uh, echocardiography probe to the, your uh, esophagus. Uh, in order to do that, like 40% of patients need the general anesthesia. It means that uh, one of the like anesthesiologists should be in the cast room, and sometimes you do the deep sedations. Then also like an uh, image specialist, like a cardiologist who is specialized in the image analysis, should be also in the cast room to do this uh, type of uh, procedures. It is just a puncture, but a lot of like human resources and time is consuming for this uh, uh, procedure. Why do we need that much uh, effort? Uh, uh, that's because there are like a lot of complications like this. Um, so, so when it is not punctured well, there is a, like a big aorta just next to the puncture site. So when you puncture the aorta or some major vessels, then there will be a lot of ble bleeding and it causes the bleeding, uh, sometimes you punctured aorta, then it's really life threatening. You need to go to the emergency surgery. Sometimes you can uh, bleed the blood into the cardiac sac so that the heart can be compressed. It is called cardiac tamponade. And this happens for the like, inexperienced cardiologist. And there is some other needs, like uh, uh, for different types of procedures, we need to puncture different sides. Well, right now, uh, with x-ray images, how can you figure out this? So we just know where exa uh, s somewhere, uh, okay, this might be good. In my experience, this is the right size, so let's go this way. That's what we are doing now, but it shouldn't be done like that. So, for example, for the left atrial appendage uh, procedure, we need to puncture the lower posterior side of this septum. And for the like pulmonary vein isolation, the optimum puncture side is like uh, anterior lower part. So these uh, separations helps uh, uh, the interventionist to do much better on their procedures. So why augmented reality is uh, useful for this type of uh, 
uh, intervention. The first thing is that this can be helpful for image guidance using 3D visualizations. It has there has been no uh, optimum uh, devices helping the real time uh, guidance. Uh, uh, with, uh, if it, this system is implemented, there will be no need for transesophageal uh, echocardiography, no need of general anesthesia or anesthesiologist in the classroom, uh, or the, we can escape from the life threatening uh, complications. And the other th issue is like about the training. So we can generate uh, some model before the complex cases. Sometimes the case is not easy. Sometimes heart has some like anomalies. Sometimes uh, the patient heart is very big. It's different from the user heart contour. Then we need to adjust to that condition. So in that like a specific case, we can generate a patient specific model, patient specific training models for that, or some specific model for specific trainings. By using that, uh, we can reduce the procedure time. We can reduce the contrast I use or X-ray uh, dose. So I'm going to uh, explain step by step how we are developing this system. So the main uh, method will be like 2D, 3D core registrations. So before going to the classroom, patients should take the uh, pre-operative, pre-procedural CAT scan, and that generates like a 3D structure of the heart. So we also se uh, segment the uh, uh, peripheral like. Uh, bone structures. It is called the spine, and using them, uh, we are gonna like uh, use them for the three D core reg registrations. And in the classroom, the real time wise, there is a, a lot of two D X ray fluoroscopy. Now, using those images, we can uh, find the catheter positions. So we have a heart, three D heart. Uh, before the surgery, before the procedure, and we have a real-time catheter positions. And in the 2D images, there is also the spine shadows from the X-ray images. So using that shadow, and also we know the where exactly the 3D position of that uh, spine is, and by matching them, co-registering them, we can generate like a 3D heart and 3D catheter in a, a augmented reality space. So first, we do the uh, uh, CT scan uh, segmentation. Uh, this can be done like a slice by slice, or you you can do this easily by semi-automatic uh, some uh, softwares like Materialized Mimics or like Osiris. A lot of softwares that you can do, and this takes like like uh, two to three hours generally. So we can prepare for the procedure before the patient go to the uh, classroom. Uh, so CT is usually taken one week or one or two weeks before the procedure. So we can prepare these 3D uh, coordinates before the procedure. And uh, sometimes for the like training wise or to developing the model, easy model, we generated a 3D printed model from the blood uh, volume. Uh, we make a shell of the uh, blood uh, outer line, then it become a, a endocardium wall, so, so that we can uh, navigate inside the heart. And this model also combined with the radio pack uh, spines, which generates like a, some like artificial spine shadows in the X-ray. Uh, by doing this, we can uh, use uh, make some algorithm to utilize the spine as a marker for the 3D registration. So, and for the catheter uh, segmentation, the classical segmentation uh, protocol is like this. You know, like we detect the edge, we detect uh, some like some restrictions on it, and uh, dilate and erode, and make the skeletalizations. This is all done by OpenCV algorithm, which you can find easily uh, from Google. And but as you can see in the image. Uh, the segmentation is not yeah, always yeah, perfect. So we utilize like a single thresholding for the conventional uh, segmentations. It is not adaptive. Even though we uh, apply the adaptive thresholding levels, it is not perfect. Sometimes it follows the shadow of the rib. Uh, sometimes they like miss uh, some part of it, this type part or the proximal part. So that's not perfect. So we thought about the uh, deep learning algorithm to solve this problem. So um, 
I mean, you know, in many cases, we can generate like very difficult conditions for catalyst detections. For example, the catalyst can be sometimes merged with the spine. Sometimes it can cross the uh, reef shadows. Uh, in many difficult cases, uh, we generate those. Uh, uh, we we collect those images and make the masks for that. Like uh, we for but it was not a really difficult problem like detecting tumors or detecting nuclei from the histology uh, tissue. But it was uh, just detecting the catheter. So we only needed like uh, one thousand images, and that was good enough for the training the uh, UNET algorithm. So UNET is like one of the. Uh, uh, most famous uh, algorithm used for the image segmentations. So I've heard that in, the, in many of these technical sessions, some people use the ResNet, some people use the UNet, and this is uh, available in the uh, like GitHub. You can always use, take them and use as you want, and you can modify that. And from the training, uh, we can uh, test those training results using some validation sets and. The model accuracy was like more than 99%. I told you this was like not a big uh, problem to solve, so it was easy. But in a spine uh, segmentation, it was not easy because, as you can see, where is the spine? The shadow is not clear. Sometimes there are some spinous processes that coming out of there, and the, when the undergraduate students segment the, <laughs> the spine, they had difficulty where to segment, where to make the mask for that. So in that case, when we validate with a poor example, the dice score become like 0 0.4. Uh, but we, when we like train uh, test them with a good example, the dice score become larger. So it has a of heterogeneity of results depending on the parameters and the data set. So, and then th so the goal is to uh, register using the spine as a landmark uh, to the uh, 3D space. Uh, but before going there, uh, we need uh, more accurate systems to implement. So we use the uh, external markers. These are actually uh, a dime. Time attached to the animal heart, animal uh, surface of the uh, animal skin, and we took the CT scan of the animal and generated the 3D uh, CAD model. And uh, from the X-ray image with different angles, a lot of uh, several different angles, we can identify where these markers are exactly. We find the center of it. Sometimes we use the uh, like a long axis angle, short axis angle. Uh, those informations are all necessary to find the three-dimensional uh, position of it. And sometimes we can use this type of like, washer for the external marker. So if by detecting this detection is not that complica complicated. Just use a, like ellip ellipsis detection, then you can detect these markers. And the catheter detection, as I mentioned, we can use that machine learning algorithm that we uh, developed by using these external markers and the catheter positions that we have, we can generate a 3D coordinates. But this is uh, still relative. I mean, these coordinates are from these X-ray images. We have to match this to the three-dimensional CT scan space. So, but uh, because we know where these markers are exactly, so we can like scale, transform, transfer to the 3D space. This is an example. So for example, the catheter one uh, goes to the left side, and uh, as you can see, the catheter is going to the left side. And each case is, even the case, uh, catheter is uh, like curving like this, we can detect this uh, catheter curvature in a 3D uh, uh, spaces. To make it clear, uh, we uh, took the picture in the real 3D printed model, and uh, as you can see, the catheter directions and positions are very well correlated to each other. So we are going to further uh, validate these results by like uh, setting some uh, multiple targets to reach. And we are going to compare the where the target position and the catheter T position is matching. And that data will be uh, soon prepared. And before that, we identified whether uh, the T position is accurate by using the electromagnetic uh, tracker. We put the EM sensor at the tip of the catheter and try to move it inside the 3D print model and follow the uh, position of the EM sensor and uh, identify the T positions using that. And compare the EM sensor position and the position identified from the X-ray images and there was a 
uh, very small error, or like one millimeter error uh, uh, generally. So we were sure that our model, our uh, image guided uh, cathode detection is uh, quite accurate and it can be applicable to the real cases. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention was like a heart is actually contracting and it's moving a lot. So uh, that is not considered here. So when we take the uh, CAT scan, we take in a diastolic phase where the heart is not moving a lot and we do the uh, electrocardiogram gated scan. So like when the heart is not moving much, we take some of the stack and uh, take some break. And when the heart is not moving, we take another stack. That's the ECG gated scanning thing. So the CT scan that we have for the heart is all generated like that. Uh, but you know, like a contractile heart, there is some motion. So we check the whether how much the tip is moving uh, inside the heart while it is contracting. It was like a four to five millimeter. Uh, but it can be uh, sometimes inaccurate uh, while, for example, we are like trying to like s put uh, which point to exactly puncture. In that case, we need to be accurate. If it is not, then we, uh, we may have a, a problem. So that is still uh, on developing phase. So, so, so I put the 3D uh, heart and catheter and spine inside the augmented reality space. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah. And you will see some strange things here. Yeah, this is an upside down world. Yeah. So I could generate uh, like endoscopic view on this uh, right side and some angled view on the left side. I can put the like cross-section shader and I can move the camera front to the uh, model that I want to watch. And uh, by moving the cross-section shader, uh, I can uh, like look inside of the heart where I want to watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see. And this is more like using a hand gesture and voice command. Uh, this is the corridor of on my left. <laughs> and the heart is generating the uh, corridor. Uh, by the open signal, the heart is open and make the, making the cross-sectional shader uh, in the middle of the heart. And uh, by ordering the close order, the heart can be closed. And I can drag the heart model by finger gesture. Mm-hmm. Yes. So uh, these uh, uh, this is special for the HoloLens uh, only because uh, they like respond to the voice command, also hand gestures, but they are not allowing the external like toolkit to uh, uh, do some uh, like manipulations, but this is uh, when you are adjusted to the hand gesture, you will feel much uh, comfortable, and yeah, there's no problem. And also, like in a real cases, in a clinical cases, doctors are handling uh, aseptic techniques, and they need to do, uh, they cannot hold anything, so like voice commander might be helpful to navigate the uh, augmented reality space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, to show the reality, I, I uh, took this video. This is a video capture from my monitor. I'm uh, watching the heart generator in the space, but you may feel a little bit dizzy watching this video. <laughs> yeah, the white dot actually uh, is where I am watching. And uh, in my real uh, view, the white dot is not moving, but in this uh, video recorded from the screen, the dot is moving. Uh, you can walk close to the heart to see the inside of the heart and by finger gesture you can move the uh, cross-section shader in a position that you want to watch mm. and you can go closer to watch where the catheter is and uh, make some plans of what to do like uh, so we're gonna like implement the some guide the, some navigation so for example in this case we need to go back backward to the right heart in order to puncture the septum. So such a, like information, such a directions will be uh, somewhere in the space so that you can watch. So 
which one do you prefer <laughs> to work with? So I don't know, maybe patients may have to decide or the doctors may have to decide. First, doctors may need to uh, know how it will affect their uh, uh, procedures. So I'm planning some uh, training experiments uh, with the uh, medical residents and fellows in Cornell uh, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital. So we are gonna like collect inexperienced users, also some experienced users, and uh, do this uh, uh, training in a 3D printed model. There will be a control group uh, and the only group using the uh, 3D printed model, and there will be some group using AR guided model. And the outcomes that we are going to measure will be like total procedure times, radiation exposure, and the accuracy. Uh, and some like a post question, uh, post study questionnaire will be done for the like subjective findings. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we developed a uh, augmented reality or mixed reality guidance system for transceptor catheterization. And uh, we are going to further develop the motion correction algorithm and um, uh, modeling for clinical images. And the first, first study will be done for the training uh, medical residents and fellows for this type of procedures. And there are still a lot of procedures that need the guidance after puncture. Uh, it's not done yet. So we have to do something after puncture. So that things need some guidance too. For example, the left atrial appendage occluded device uh, is like a docking the a spaceship in the uh, universe. So we may we are gonna make some docking systems and showing like the spaceship docking. So that will be really nice for education too. Yeah. Uh, this is our lab members. Uh, where am I? Uh, oh. That's not real. <laughs> I think the image is augmented, right? Yeah. Thank you for uh, listening. Yeah. yeah. Let's open up the floor for questions. Uh, do you feel that um, AR has advantages over virtual reality for training in these type of scenarios? Um, so when you do the virtual reality, uh, you are uh, like watching. I, I've seen some some uh, training uh, results from different type of uh, uh, research. For example, like a panic attack treatment. They use the uh, like a virtual reality tool. They use the augmented reality tool and iPad only, things like that. And they show the no difference at all And uh, for now. But actually, virtual reality, you cannot move anything. So you don't know what your fingers are doing. So yeah, there is limited experience for the training, actually. So maybe for the education-wise, like getting the knowledge from the anatomy, like what the Case Western Reserve uh, University is doing for the medical student uh, education for anatomy, that types of things, maybe virtual reality is good enough. But for the like real hands-on training things, augmented reality or mixed reality may have a much better role. Mm -hmm. Did you use uh, any other uh, AR, XR, MR tools like Magic Leap or other ones that you had good experience with? Um, for my son, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I showed my heart in uh, in front of my son, and he was jumping into the heart to grab it. Uh, yeah, I hope someday may. Well, I'm presenting this 3D dimensional technology in a 2D space. Maybe someday I hope to present in a hologram space. That's my hope. Yeah. So I think you kind of hit it in the last sentence about, you know, we live in a 3D space mm -hmm. and we've learned in a 3D space, but when you have to operate in the 2D space, mm -hmm. you have to kind of relearn kind of the spatial, you know, the measurements around you. Mm -hmm. So as part of your training, uh, I mean, this is this is application of what you've kind of seen and learned. Mm -hmm. But when you kind of get into the higher school education system, like how much of the 2D and the 3D world are you expecting to collapse? Mm. So you other mean other than games? Because I, I think the kids today play games, mm -hmm. and they're much better at, you know, at least their 
parents only because they know how to deal with the 3D space in mm-hmm. in 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 the game theory world. Yeah, yeah. I think so for the education wise, uh, we are in a phase of uh, moving to the 3D because in a long time ago we didn't give iPad to the students, but iPad is really commercially available to everyone now. But someday these are VR or AR devices might be available to everyone. This one is like three thousand dollars, which is not possible for the general uh, uh, people to buy. But there are like uh, much cheaper ones, like three three hundred dollars. You can buy some gaming console uh, for the three hundred dollars. Uh, so people, it will get really popular in a, a common. Uh, field and education wise so someday you know, there will be a lot of modules educational modules that is easy to develop actually f- uh, for the first part of this uh, augmented reality space so, yeah. Thanks. so I saw the model is a like kind of representi- representation of the solid do you consider about the deformation or mechanical properties of the tissues of the muscle in the heart yeah, um, that would be a, like a very exciting uh, things to do. Right now, we are focusing on like ac- accurately presenting the three-dimensional positions, but definitely uh, that will uh, make much better feelings. But I think there should be some haptic experience in the hand. For example, when we touch the catheter to the wall, doctors feel something. Oh, then we touch the wall, but here uh, with this augmented reality, we don't feel it. So, for example, like robotic surgeries, they made a haptic sensor at the tip, at the hand, and then they can feel some dead haptics. That helps the doctors to do the surgery much better. Like that, this type of uh, like augmented uh, delivery things uh, by, like uh, as you mentioned, uh, applying the world uh, characteristics, some compressibilities and elasticity, things like that, and that would really help um, uh, Augmenting the real experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right, excellent. Round of applause once again. Love where technology is going. You've seen a lot of it over the past two days. Uh, we now have a break.